Joining us, going on the financial merry ground of American banking is Brian Moynihan, who's chairman, chief executive officer of Bank of America. Wonderful to have you here. It's great you, to be you're, here. You're the only guy in the Valley enthused because the Celtics won by 20 points. That's that's very good. That's very good. Now, snow's quieter, I'll say that. Snow's so, quieter. <laughs> snow's quieter. Deafening. Let us get right to it. Lisa's got some specific questions. I want to talk about your messaging, which the last number of days has been, I think, best quality, best messaging of what banks are doing in Davos, what banks are doing for their employees, for their people. You are sending, along with other executives, a clarion call of $22 an hour. When you walked in the door at Bank of a Boston years ago, did you actually think we'd be talking about banks leading on minimum wage? Well, I, I'm not sure 25 years ago it was as relevant, but when, I, when, when the team took over in 2010, we made a pact that no employee would be anywhere close to the family of four, you know, poverty level that's right. calculated by MIT. And we've just been moving the wages up since then. And then the second thing we did is that's, that was 20, and then we moved up a little faster given the things that we advanced this year from 20, the 21 to 22 that was going to happen to fall and happen now. But it's a set of principles. It goes much broader than that. It goes how we have health care. So our teammates are, are at the lower earning, have had no health care increases for, since 2011. So their, their premium, for lack of a better term, has been flat. Do they have a TV show at Bank of America? Yeah. I think so. I don't, let me cut to the chase. Yeah. You've provided leadership here, as have others yeah. in finance. I sat on this set years ago with a healthcare executive who got holy hell from his board for three weeks because his people were near the poverty line. Yeah. You're up to $22 per hour, and yet you still have to reattach the elites and Wall Street banking to the American people. How are you doing on that? And what is the mandate this year to reattach Wall Street to Main Street? Well, at the end of the day, we serve our clients, whether they're mass market consumers, general consumers, wealthy consumers, small businesses, large businesses, and, and trading partners and investors around the world. And, and that's how you attach yourself. You start what we call response growth. We, ha we have to grow no excuses. We have to do it on a client-focused basis. We're a client and company. Our, our mission, purpose, whatever you want to call it, is to help our clients live their lives. It's not our life, it's their life. And that's where I think you know, we in the industry, and, and we're not alone here, have gotten it right for the last decade. So from the financial crisis where we were the cause, and my first Davos was around then, and it was not a fun place to be for a bank, to now where in the pandemic you saw that, especially in America, the banking system step in and help across the board with you know, forgiveness of payments, with uh, financing uh, mm -hmm. industries. And so you know, that's because we have great capital, great liquidity, all the rules, the stress testing, all gave everybody comfort that we could go help with the economy. Does Elizabeth Warren know this? I, everybody knows it. Oh, Brian, there's this good uh, social business, and then there's good business business, and a lot of the higher wages have to do with a yeah. lack of employees. How hard is it to hire qualified employees? And I'm not just talking at the branches, but also in the rank and file in your offices in New York City. Well, look, our, our turnover when, when back when the team took over was probably near 20 came down to 15. We got it down to 12 right before the pandemic. It was on a long term, you just drop, drop, drop down. Fell to six in the pandemic, of course, because we came out in the pandemic and the first day we sent everybody home. Everybody gets their job. Nobody has to worry about a job. And we kept everybody on. We moved them around. We did all this stuff. It moved back up to 12 and at 13. So last week we announced a three, five, and seven percent wage increase for all employees under 100,000 in the company, which is a, a, a good number of people based on years of service. We're trying to reward loyalty and career building and pass. So the $22 an hour, Tom, isn't just the $22, it's $45,000 it, it a year. It ratchets right up It, it keeps go. going up. But also, but also we $10,000 of tuition reimbursement in advance for people getting degrees. So an 18-year-old. Yeah, TV show. <laughs> so, so you think about that, or the health care benefits, or the mental health benefits. If we just announced today that for teammates under 250, we'll give them $4,000 to buy an electric vehicle, part of our environment, going to your point, our environmental mm -hmm. commitment. Now, the key to all this is, to your point, Lisa, stabilize the employee base. We right. have 200,000 people, you have 25,000 branches, 14,000 call operators, 50,000 or 25,000 people in operations. Having t people work for us for 15, 20 years in a career path is a lot more effective operation. Well, but in the investment banking world, yeah. in the securities operations, when you're dealing with a market that has seen a pretty big sell-off and yeah. a pretty big disruption, and we're expecting a pretty big slowdown yeah. in certain investment banking services, yeah. do you expect that bonuses will have to come down? And how hard will it be then to retain that style, that uh, Look, th th those, those colleagues that work in those very narrow areas, and you, you guys always ask about that, we pay 90,000 people bonuses a year. So 
So, you know, it's a much different equation than a company like ours. Those colleagues ebb and flow with the market. That's, that's what they do. They know they are. And look, Matthew Coder and team are gaining market share in a very difficult market because the pools are down. And, and they've done a good job. And on the trading side, frankly, we're more than holding our own and the trading revenues have been, you know, okay and solid. But it's... But, but how know, much do you feel like you have to keep up the bonuses in order to oh, preserve I, staff because those of the are, Those will adjust based on okay. the things. We'll see how the year comes out. It's still early. Moynihan didn't work 100 hour <laughs> weeks out of Brown. He knows what it, what it takes. With us, Brian Moynihan, he's chairman, chief executive officer of Bank of America. We welcome all of you across America on radio, on television, and of course, worldwide. Brian, I want to talk about digital banking. You and I talked about it. We had less, it was back when the Red Sox were winning. And the pandemic sped it all up, yeah. right? How at risk is the branch system? When you look at digital banking and the success that you've had, and yeah. frankly, others have had, do you, do you co-op businesses to make it bigger? Do you build them yourself? It is a digital first at Bank of America. So we've been digital first for 15 years in the thought process. It just took customers. You can't get ahead of your customers. So you're always working. And we're high touch and high tech. That's the words we use. You need those branches because certain people want to go to the branches. Certain types of tasks still people get confused and want to go in. And that mm -hmm. cash is still important. I got asked earlier. I pulled some cash out of my pocket. I said, you still use cash? Between today and tomorrow, $200 million, we've got our ATMs and cash. And so we, the ATM structure is important. So it takes all kinds. That's what makes our business model superior. Now, the question is, how do you optimize it? So we run that huge consumer business, the largest in the country, on about 115, 120 basis points of deposits. That's phones, digital branches, everything else. By getting the, you know, the tasks that customers, you know, that are not high value tasks, we've engineered them out digitally, and yet, you know, the consultative tasks, which are incredibly important, right. those have expanded the branches. Do and so we have 4,000 branches, we used to have 6,000, but by the way, we just had our, I think today we announced our 16th branch in Utah. We didn't have any three years ago, so we're building out in cities we aren't there. Do you build digital platforms, and these are just names, yeah. I'm not, I, if you want to make some news here, help us, affirm, uplift the airline people, yeah. the different digital platforms that are nascent, do you acquire them? Do you learn from them? What's the acquisition strategy of digital knowledge? We, we don't, we don't, I mean, like in the, in the cash management business, we acquired a company a couple years ago that was, uh, had a specialization in certain types of things. We, we'll do that, but that's, that's really not, you know, we're, we can't make any acquisitions of anybody of any size in the world we're in, and, and, and by law, frankly, anybody has deposit base. So we build it. Now, we build it in partnership with people, and sometimes we build it ourselves, and sometimes we build, like Zelle was built by the industry, and now it's, you know, bigger than Venmo. I, I look, and by the way, your presentation in earnings time, we live it. We get the earnings out in real time yeah. and we've got to look like we're smart. Your Zell statistic is stunning. Right, do we have a, a, you know, it's, so what, what is Zell doing? What Zell's doing is if you look at checks written, they're down 25% pre-pandemic to now. Two, three years, 25%. The dollar volume's flat. Now, why is that happening? Because all the little checks are going by way of Zelle. So if you, if I owed you money at lunch, I'd pay. And so that, that. What? Yeah. It goes to children. Yeah, well, it goes to children, too. But <laughs> children. Not all of us. <laughs> I do want to get your sense on, on the pulse of the consumer, though, because yeah. you really have a bird's eye view. Yeah. Do you find it a good time to keep seeing those credit card borrowings expand yeah. at a time when a lot of consumers are feeling crimped by inflation? So let's, let's pull back and just look at it overall. So there are a couple key points. Number one, the account balance of the consumer pre-pandemic to now are multiples bigger. So a person had uh, you know, two to 3,000 average collective balance in their accounts, now has, and that would have been about 1,400, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, one to 2,000 would have been about 1,400, is now almost 4,000 bucks. A person that had two to 5,000 would have about 3,500 on average, it now has $13,000. So just step back and think about it. It grew 5% in the month of April from March. So what you're seeing is consumers have more money in their accounts. The, the idea that they spent the pandemic money that came in January, March last year, just not true. Now, the second question is they pay down their credit card balances. From 100 billion we were down to 70, it's back up to 80, lots of borrowing capacity. The third point is, are they spending? And that's what's interesting. In the first two weeks of May, the consumer spent 10% more than they did last May. 
And that's over top of the payments that went out to pay taxes. So the consumer is spending, and tra people say, well, it's inflation driven. 8% more transactions. Somebody doesn't uh, use Sorry, just, I just want yeah. I don't want to interrupt because we're going to extend this to 45 minutes. This is the real Moynihan, guys. This is the bank nerd giving us the operational stuff here. But this actually goes to the heart of a lot of the economic questions of the moment, right? Because everyone's talking recession here and stagflation. We were speaking with Bob Prince of Bridgewater. What you're saying does not scream of stagflation or recession. So that's this is that's why I said this. We were talking earlier. This is what makes the job, you know, the Fed's job hard and easy. Hard, hard, easy in that you have consumers in good shape, you know, not over leveraged. The uh, home uh, values went up, but frankly, the our LTV in our portfolio is in the 50s. So to give you a sense, so you know, they, 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 the prices went up and people didn't borrow it out and stuff. So that's mm -hmm. the good news. The bad news is what's going to slow them down. So if you look at TSA Travel Sunday, it was over top of 19 by 10 percent. That some number of people went through the airport. So what's going to slow them down? Yeah. So what's going to slow them down? Nothing right now. And so the question is, you, you know, so the Fed has this tip, this very difficult thing of of getting them to slow down without slowing them down too much. And then the second thing is, the unemployment rate is really low. And so if you look at our Michael Hart, it's a great economist. You know, he, he's he's, okay. he's got <laughs> he's got you know he's got this year you know mid to high two. You know he's got next year you know mid ones, uh, but it's slowing down the next year. If you look at his quarters, it's slowing down. So the idea. Is the Fed's okay. the Fed's work slows you down. Now the problem is he still has unemployant three and a half four percent. You're saying wait, that Doesn't can't slow, you can't slow a consumer <laughs> down is is working because they have money spent. So that's a difficulty. I believe, you know, I believe it's I believe that they're going to be able to manage this flow, but it's going to be a tricky execution. Mm -hmm. Then there's things outside their control, the pandemic resurgence, you know, something going different in the war. But America's much different than Europe and other places right. because of this dynamic of the vibrancy of the U.S. consumer. Brian Moynihan with us fired up about banking in Davos. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keen on radio and television. And we've been, this has been really enjoyable to talk to you away from Fed speak. I give Lisa and John Farrell nonstop grief yes. over, the, over the parlor game of guessing the Fed. Do you sit at your desk and guess the Fed? I once told... Uh, the Fed chair a couple times ago. If they would quit publishing dot plots, I could probably save 50 people in our country. Is there company. too much? Is there it's too much high, information it's, nowadays? No, no, they're doing it. It's right. important. They, 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 the portfolio and the work they do on it, and, and they've been very transparent. And you know, Ben Bernanke started leading that, and that gives the market comfort. Yeah. But the fact is, it does lead a lot of mental uh, gymnastics of whose dots whose and whose dots more important. Look, at the end of the day, they work meeting to meeting. They work on the facts. You yeah. know that. Stan Fisher, the great uh, vice chair, once said to a group of CEOs. You guys are all nuts. You think we have some, we have long-term views of what's happened, but we work meeting to meeting and stand, you know, we all like to stand like you're calling us nuts and you said, okay, now we got it, which is, they're dealt with a deck of information. They have to make a decision. That decision happens. They made a decision. But by the way, 350 basis point rates, one behind us, two ahead of us, that's unprecedented speed. Right. Now, the, but by the way, Tom, you'll remember this in 80, they went, 81 or where they, they went up 10 points in a year. Yeah. You know, so there's yeah. been times when they had to, and they, they know what to do. But the question is, it's just, it's going to be interesting with the consumer being in this good shape. It's going to be an interesting I want topic. you to speak to America, though, about the complete focus on Jerome Powell and the Fed. And we're talking to bankers like you, like your macroeconomic professors at Brown University. Is your crystal ball any better than Lisa Bramowitz's? I, I can look at what our clients do. So our small business originations are up 20, 30% year over year. The small business consumers are spending money. Are they worried about inflation? Yeah, because every time they open a paper, <laughs> the paper says worry about inflation and it's Fed's job to take on inflation. But at the end of the day, if you look at their behavior, mm. they're worried about supply chains, they're worried about getting labor, those yeah. things. That's what goes on in small business. And these are 12 million of them and we surveyed them for 10 years and you have really consistent data. So I think the key is not to get caught up in the you know, if the 10 years at 300 or 280, you know, that traders, that's a really important thing. The reality is, is the underlying economy moving? Right. And that's what you see. And that, you know, so as you watch, yes, are people moving from in-home purchases to back to the store purchases? Are they going to vacation instead of buying extra goods and hoarding because they had to in a pandemic? All that behavior is changing. And, and that's natural behavior, so, but that's the reality. Before we let you go, you were talking earlier about Elon Musk. And you were talking about how you were sympathetic to his view on ESG. Yeah and being overly complicated, and in some cases, inaccurate with respect to what it was measuring. How would you hope they would recast it, and what is it not catching right now? So it's not ESG, it's, it's the metric system and the proliferation of metrics. So at the International Business Council here at WEF three years ago, we announced a set of metrics that we've got 150 companies incorporating, 70 of them disclosed them, 150 total. 
you need simplification here so people don't argue about doing the work, they do the work and actually do the underlying behavior. These metrics go across the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, four pillars, 22 metrics, the big four accounting firms developed them. All companies can do them, 70 companies are doing it, we're on our second year. The problem is, is when you move to other things, the proliferation of metrics puts more energy in trying to meet all the things than it does actually change the behavior. We need to move on the environment. We have to, we have to stay with oil companies to help them make the transition. We have to bring the new energy on. You know, Who's not doing their that's job? That's the work. It, it, so the reality is, is so, you know, metrics, people can say, I like, I, I like this better than that. The answer is we run our company profits in person. So what's the best practices that Savita Subramanian invented at Bank right. of America? So what she did is, for years she did research that clearly showed that if people scored poorly on ESG mm -hmm. scores, uh, if you avoided those companies as a portfolio manager, you would miss 90, 95, 98 percent of the bankruptcies. So if you're a large cap manager and you can avoid the real losses, right. that's a big gain, right? Mm -hmm. So Savita's been a leader in sort of developing the thought process and the investment process around this. What we're doing when the metrics develop the right. operating process, this is about operating companies. Do you want us to do charity, which we do 500 million a year spectacular? Do you want us to you know, do this? No, you want us to take our $60 billion expense okay. base and aim it to make things happen. That's what's some fantastic, our $3 trillion balance sheet, that's what's going on. We've gone too long because we had to have the duck boat come up here to catch you out of our TV studios. Brian Moynihan, thank, thank you, you so much from Bank of America. Greatly appreciate it.